Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hi, we're back again. Uh, trying to finish up some of these topics related to force versus displacement uh, measurements with an atomic force microscope. In this particular lecture, we're going to just discuss uh, uh, the ability for an atomic force microscope to produce uh, modulus and adhesion maps. And uh, I'd like to run through some simple examples and describe to you what's possible and uh, give you some sense of how this uh, this type of uh, measurement is actually made. <clears throat> I think the the uh, the uh, the point to emphasize is that once uh, the atomic force microscope was shown to give these marvelous uh, images in three dimensions of of samples uh, with nanometer resolution, it also became clear that you could use the uh, AFM to, to, to perform a, an entirely new class of experiments. And uh, the idea is pretty simple because the, since the AFM is a proximal probe, it just lo looks very locally at, uh, um, or it has the capability of looking very locally at the properties of a substrate. You can imagine that if you're doing a, an image scan and measuring the topography of a substrate, you see some nanoscale object uh, that's on the substrate, and you want to learn more about what that nanoscale object might be, uh, all of a sudden the AFM uh, allows you the, the possibility of asking the question, you know, what could be the structural properties of that particular object? And so you might... Uh, might imagine being able to position the tip above that object and executing a force versus displacement curve and then interpreting that force versus displacement curve to infer uh, interesting uh, uh, structural properties about the nanoscale object of interest. So this capability was very clear to uh, a lot of people in the very early days of AFM and uh, basically um, we're, we're going to describe how that whole process can be automated and then show you some examples of that. Uh, so just as a way of reminder, um, this is the standard force versus displacement experiment. Uh, it's summarized or it's condensed down into four, uh, four snapshots of what's actually happening at different, different points along the, uh, the experiment. And at the uh, bottom of the slide, we're showing the, the uh, final answer, right? The final answer plots the loading force versus the uh, sample displacement. Um, the solid, or the dashed line indicates what you would expect if the substrate were infinitely hard. Uh, the, the experimental data always will lie to the, uh, to the far side of that uh, dashed line. Uh, indicating that the substrate or the tip is actually indenting or deforming, right? Uh, you see the jump to contact feature that we've discussed uh, at some, uh, some, in some detail. And on, re on uh, uh, withdrawal, you'll see the, f the feature in the uh, force versus displacement curve that allows you to map the adhesion of the tip uh, to the substrate. So this is experimentally what your software will uh, often display to you. Uh, but in reality, uh, the experiment is done in real time. And so I, it's useful to think about uh, what the force uh, that the tip experiences versus time might look like. And I, I uh, illustrate that in the uh, top region of the, uh, uh, the top panel of this uh, view graph, right? This is actually what goes on with time. And of course, your software just folds everything back and gives you a, a standard uh, force versus displacement uh, curve that's shown in the bottom. Uh, but <clears throat> once you realize that the signals that, that your, your instrument is actually acquiring, those are time domain signals, then you can start to uh, think about how to use that information in a systematic way, perhaps to extract out more information uh, than just a force versus displacement curve performed at one point on the sample. And um, 
So this is something that, that a lot of people realized in the late uh, 1900s. Um, so maybe 10 years or so after the atomic force microscope was established, uh, uh, various groups throughout the world started to think in this term. Uh, and these terms that I've sort of sketched out in this, in this slide. Uh, so <clears throat> each feature in that force versus displacement curve, right, each feature uh, can be mapped into a, uh, into a three-dimensional map, uh, which gives you information about the sample. So for instance, the loading force, the preset loading force, that's, uh, uh, that's indicated by the solid black dot on the force versus displacement curve. That point gives you infer the displacement of the substrate that's required to achieve that loading force that then gives rise to a topographic image. And so for some uh, position of the tip at, uh, on the substrate, let's say uh, position I comma J, right? <clears throat> you can use the uh, information that's obtained from doing the first for force versus displacement curve to give you the topographic image. But simultaneously, there's no reason why you couldn't measure, let's say, the slope of the force versus indentation curve, or force versus displacement curve. You measure that slope. Uh, that slope is related to the modulus of the sample at that particular point, right? So you could imagine making a modulus map simultaneously with the topographic map. And then also by measuring the liftoff force when the tip is at a particular point on the substrate, right? You could, you could also imagine making an adhesion map. Uh, is the is the sample is scanned uh, over the substrate. Um, so uh, all you have to do to achieve this goal is to write some software that's sufficiently flexible that allows you to pull off of this standard force versus displacement curve, which it, here I plot as a function of time. And you just have to pull relevant information off that curve in a, in a periodic and systematic fashion. So typically, <clears throat> when you do a, a, an adhesion map or a modulus map, uh, you do not perform it at the same resolution as the topographic map, simply because of the time uh, required to, uh, to do this. So typically, um, you know, if you had a, if you had to make an estimate, Typically, an adhesion map or a, a modulus map contains something on the order of 128 by 128 pixels. And to acquire an image uh, with that uh, 128 by 128 pixel resolution, that typically requires five to 10 minutes to complete. So that, that tells you immediately that during the course of the experiment, you have to have a very stable uh, uh, situation. You, you can't have a lot of thermal drift and um, uh, re requires you to warm your system up and let everything stabilize if you're going to get reliable data. <clears throat> so uh, this is just a real simple example of, of something that we were able to achieve uh, here at Purdue in the very early days of this uh, uh, adhesion mapping uh, and uh, modulus mapping uh, uh, business. Uh, we did some experiments on very simple samples that we had available in the lab. Simple samples consisted of a, a gold bridge that were connected by two uh, much larger uh, gold contact pads. Uh, everything was, uh, the, the gold bridge and the gold contact pads were evaporated onto a hard glass substrate. And uh, we wrote some simple software that allowed us to uh, uh, measure, for instance, topography and adhesion simultaneously as we scanned over, let's say, a small region of this substrate. Uh, so the type of information we were able to uh, obtain are, are indicated in the two slides in the uh, far right-hand corner. Uh, the results aren't terribly uh, of terrible, of, of great interest scientifically, but they, in, they, they demonstrate and they illustrate a, a very nice capability. So we were able to immediately identify the topographic features just from the height, height histograms of the different uh, regions of the sample. And uh, so we were then able to uh, map out average heights and we were able to estimate uh, 
uh, from this uh, topographic uh, uh, analysis the roughness of each of the uh, uh, three regions of the substrate that we were imaging simultaneously. And then in addition to that, we, we focused on the adhesion, the pull-off force of the tip from the substrate. We were able to do histograms of the pull-off force in different regions of the substrate. And the, these histograms showed very nicely that, uh, that on average, the tip uh, stuck or adhered much, str much more strongly to the glass than it did to the gold. And it also showed there was a slight difference between the thick gold, uh, the adhesion to a thick gold contact pad and uh, the adhesion to a thinner uh, uh, gold bridge. That, that also came through very nicely. Uh, the, the, this whole uh, area has progressed quite a bit uh, uh, in the last uh, 12, 15 years. Um, I'd just like to run through an example of sort of what I consider a state-of-the-art uh, adhesion and modulus mapping. Uh, this is a study that was performed at Purdue by uh, uh, Ryan Wagner, a student of Arvind Rahman's. Um, and <clears throat> he investigated the uh, mechanical uh, properties of something called a cellulose nanocrystal. So in this slide, it's referred to as CNC. Uh, cellulose nanocrystal is uh, uh, an object that's obtained from the pulp of a, a tree. Right? So if you uh, decompose the uh, wood from a tree, you'll find that ultimately the wood is comprised of these uh, very small uh, nanocrystals. They have diameters roughly between 5 and 50 nanometers. They have different lengths. And the question is, you know, what's the modulus of elasticity of, of, of uh, one of these cellulose nanocrystals? And uh, how, how do you go about making that measurement in a systematic way? So um, in this particular study, um, uh, all the I's were dotted and all the T's were crossed. That's why I'm uh, referring to it in, this, in the course of this talk. Now, I just by way of a uh, very quick summary, point out they checked accurately the Z calibration of their instrument by uh, scanning um, uh, uh, a reference sample and measuring very accurately the height difference between the base and the uh, and the and the, the the top plateau of a, a well-defined feature. They calibrated the uh, uh, spring constant of the cantilever using this thermal tuning method. That'll be discussed more in part two of this course. <clears throat> They also calibrated their spring constants. Uh, they, they performed uh, force versus displacement curves on very stiff samples. That's also indicated. And then they also went through and uh, made an effort to show that the tip that they used in the experiments was not appreciably altered by uh, showing very nice uh, scanning electron microscope images of the tip before and the tip after. Uh, the uh, modulus maps were made. Uh, the basic idea is they were able to uh, image these CNC nanocrystals that's indicated by this bright ridge on this, uh, uh, this uh, topographic image. At different points on that CNC, in fact, at different points over the entire image, they executed these, the uh, typical sample versus force uh, displacement curve. Uh, the, types of uh, just a representative uh, displacement curve versus voltage from the uh, position sensitive detector. That's representative uh, set of data is shown in the, in the slide. Uh, the software is sophisticated enough now that you can go in and you can analyze each of those curves. And in this particular case, I think they're, they're, they're yeah, they converted the, uh, the sample displacement in Z to, uh, I think, a distance, a gap separation distance D. Uh, the data shown here is the indentation part of the curve. So this is showing how the tip indents into the uh, CNC. Uh, 
The CNC were infinitely hard. Of course, all this data would be a vertical line centered uh, at, at the distance z, uh, equal to zero in this plot. You can see they were able to estimate the uncertainties uh, at each data point, these uncertainties are just related to the experimental noise that's contained in the, in, in the individual data points in those, in that uh, force versus displacement curve shown in the upper right. And then at the end of the day, uh, if you perform this measurement, you'll have uh, uh, an ensemble of data points along the, uh, the CNC. And, uh, these ensemble of data points can then be uh, plotted and you can start to get systematic uh, uh, and statistically significant information about such things as, for instance, the Young's modulus. So they found that the Young's modulus, uh, the average value of the Young's modulus for the, this, the CNC was on the order of eight gigapascal. You can see the range of, of variability in their experimental data, which is very nice because now you can add uh, 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 an uncertainty estimate to the uh, average elastic modulus uh, by focusing on the uh, liftoff forces that uh, required to remove the tip from the uh, CNC nanocrystal. Uh, they were able to estimate an average uh, uh, liftoff force. That liftoff force can then be interpreted uh, uh, using various models to, to get the uh, uh, the work that's required, the surface energy, basically, between the tip and the, and the CNC nanocrystal, right? So they found a, a number, and again, you can see the spread in the data, so you can, you can actually associate an error bar with the numbers that they uh, achieve. So uh, <clears throat> these, um, this ability to automate this whole process and obtain these uh, modulus maps and to, uh, also to obtain adhesion maps as a function of X and Y over a, a sample with nanometer resolution. That's a unique feature of the atomic force microscope and it's being widely exploited uh, in labs throughout the world. Um, I just wanted to give you an example uh, of a, what I consider a very nice study, very systematic, careful study that's been performed. And uh, um, hopefully you might find a, a use for the uh, for this type of uh, measurement in, in the research that you're uh, uh, performing. Um, so um, the next lecture, which will end week four of the first part of this course, uh, I'd like to just discuss lateral force microscopy in a general way and try to show you some of the uh, um, experiments that uh, a lateral force microscope can perform and give you a little bit of background about how a lateral force microscope works. So come on back for the next lecture. We'll have a short, short overview of this, uh, uh, this type of uh, microscopy um, in that lecture. So thank you very much and see you at the next, next lecture.